Welcome to A Taste of AZ Podcast. My name is Luke Irvin, and today we've got an epic episode lined up for you. But before we jump into that, just want to let you guys know real quick, we've got some brand new merchandise up on our website, including these thanks for supporting local hats and two new shirts as well. If you like today's episode, please also leave us a review on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow our email newsletter. With nothing else to say, let's jump into today's episode. Hello, A Taste of AZ listeners. We are here today at a wonderful fresh French restaurant in the heart of Old Town, uh, right on the luxury wing of Fashion Square, and I'm here with the Chef de Cuisine, is that correct? Yes. Would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Connor Harmon, Chef de Cuisine here at Francine Restaurant. Absolutely. And tell us a little bit about what Francine is. So Francine is the brainchild of Laurent Halaz. Uh, it's named after his mother, Francine. Uh, she kind of started working a little bit with uh, Roger Verger, a very famous French chef, kind of one of the creators of classic French cuisine, uh, really pioneered a cuisine style called Cuisine du Soleil, which is cuisine of the sun, focusing a lot on fresh ingredients, um, just the, the local and fresh, not really too pretentious, just good quality ingredients. So Francine, the namesake of the restaurant, was a chef or was she like a restaurateur? What was she exactly? She loved to cook. That's what it was. She was just a great cook. Okay. Uh, she she learned a little bit from Roger Verger because they grew up in a very similar area and mm. so they kind of worked together a little bit. Uh, but she just was a great cook. And what she kind of things cook, was so. she cooking? Or is she cooking, I guess? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she's... Uh, so she actually had some recipes on our menu, our salmon carpaccio, mm. which unfortunately is no longer on our menu. Mm. Uh, that was one of her recipes... Uh, Laurent brought it over here when he started this restaurant. Uh, yeah. Is is salmon carpaccio? I know carpaccio as a preparation is like a French thing, but is salmon specifically something people would have a lot in France? Salmon, not super often. Uh, they focus mostly on uh, Mediterranean fish. So mm. bronzino, which is a type of sea bass, is a very, very popular fish over there. Um, that one you wouldn't necessarily eat as a carpaccio. Uh, they would do a lot of little beef carpaccios. Uh, a lot of focus on the food is raw food. So you can have the tartars, carpaccios, crudos of different kind of presentations, different proteins. And so for, I figure most of our listeners would probably know what it is, but what is a carpaccio exactly? It is thin sliced raw protein. Uh, you can have a beef carpaccio of steak. You can have different kinds of fish carpaccio. It is just raw, thin slice. And a lot of times people will put like, uh, you know, garnishes or like vinaigrettes or something like that mm-hmm. on them, correct? Yes. Yeah, so our salmon carpaccio used to have a champagne vinaigrette and some fried capers, a little mm. bit of fresh scallions. That sounds fantastic. It was, yeah. Right now we have a great beef carpaccio on our menu uh, with a little bit of truffle aioli and some fresh arugula and parmesan. Just really simple classic. Okay. Do those rotate or have those been around for a while? Uh, we change our menu, try to do it a little bit seasonally. Uh, so okay. every couple of months we'll change a few dishes here and there. Just got to keep it fresh. And so you mentioned you have a beef carpaccio. Do you have another one on the menu as well? At the moment, we have a hamachi crudo. Uh, it's mm. similar to a carpaccio. It's just kind of a different term for raw protein. Sure. Uh, so we're using hamachi with sauce vierge, which is a very traditional French sauce of tomato, fresh herbs, lots of olive oil, and lemon juice. And so we introduced the restaurant itself a little bit, but I must say this is one of the most beautiful restaurants I've been in recently, and I have the pleasure of traveling to a lot of restaurants for photos and whatnot. Fortunately, I don't get to eat in them every <laughs> single time, uh, but I'm blessed to be able to visit spots like this. And I love the way the kind of, you know, you have the nice bright white component of it, but you have a lot of the natural touches as well. The bar is not only stunning with the design of it, but then you've got all the plants on top. Would you talk a little bit about the design of this place? So the idea is to kind of transport you to the French Riviera. You're mm. supposed to have ideas of sitting along the, the Mediterranean uh, at a fresh cafe. So we're not doing a very pretentious white tablecloth fine dining restaurant. We want you to feel comfortable when you come in here. We want you to feel relaxed and enjoy yourself. And they spared definitely no expense uh, on making that set up. So we have these big lofty open rooms. It's not too confined. We want you to feel like you have the space to breathe and to enjoy your meal. Absolutely. When I feel like um, when you have a very seasonal, uh, fresh ingredient focused menu, things like the wood ties and the linens and those, those natural touches kind of immerse you in the feeling of what a fresh menu should feel like. Would you say so? Absolutely. So you also have kind of a cool layout where, you know, you have this beautiful dining room, but then the kitchen is open as well. Talk to me a little bit about your guys' kitchen. Is there anything unique about it? 
Uh, so we have a great stone fire oven or st- uh, gas fire oven, but it's a stone oven. Okay. Um, so we do a lot of our fresh breads in there. We'll bake things mm. all together with extra char. We do a lot of vegetables in there as well. Kind of gives that extra roast on them. That oven gets up to about 600 degrees. Wow. So it's a little bit hotter than your traditional oven at home. Uh, we have a great gas fire grill in there as well with broiler. Uh, so we just do a lot of our cooking over there. What is the difference between cooking with a gas uh, stone oven versus a bricks or a, see, I did the same thing, <laughs> yeah. a, a wood fired stone oven. So a wood oven, you're going to get a little bit more of the natural flavor, obviously from the, from the wood, you're going to get some more of that smokiness from the wood. Uh, unfortunately with our location, we actually are not allowed to have any wood oh, fire really? here because we are attached to the mall. Mm. And so there's some regulations uh, there, which is unfortunately why we can't have the wood. Uh, but the stone itself of the oven allows it to retain its heat very well, mm. which is why it gets up to about 600 degrees. And what uh, what dishes are you doing in that oven? Well, we do a lot of our preparation in that oven. So so for our eggplant caviar we have on the menu, we have roast mm. eggplant in that oven and get a nice little char on that. And then we peel the, peel the skin off of it and kind of just uh, mix the meat with some sesame, uh, a little bit of feta, chives, herbs. Uh, we also cook our flatbread in there that goes with it. We cook our whole roasted cauliflower in there, just mm. uh, throw it in there, let it get a nice little char on it, and that one gets served with a little bit of salsa verde and lemon yogurt. So before we continue digging into the menu and the restaurant itself, tell me a little bit about your background. So I grew up in Baltimore, okay. uh, Baltimore, Maryland. I kind of traveled around a little bit, went to culinary school up in New Hampshire, mm. and then bounced out to L.A., worked uh, in Four Seasons re- hotels and resorts out there. And then actually uh, had a very lucky opportunity. I went to Alinea in Chicago, and I was there for about two years. It's a three Michelin star restaurant nice. by Grant Ackett's, really focused on molecular gastronomy, a lot of new age, uh, contemporary type style cooking. Uh, so I was able to learn quite a lot there about product knowledge and different techniques that you might not necessarily see elsewhere. And then after that, I was looking to get into management. So I bounced around to a couple different restaurants as sous chef in Chicago uh, before settling down in Phoenix. And so, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there's not too much molecular gastronomy going on here. What is like the difference between working in a spot like that and working in a place like this? Uh, it's very different. So at a place like that, you are still using very high quality ingredients, but you're manipulating them in a way, so mm-hmm. they're not their base form. Whereas this restaurant and this cuisine we're doing here, we are doing as little as we can to ingredients. Mm-hmm. We want the ingredient to just shine as it is, which places a huge focus on getting the best and the freshest of the ingredients because quite simply all we're doing to them is salting them and cooking them. Mm. Which is like when I think of French food, I think of, you know, techniques like creating a souffle and stuff like that. Would you say that the way you describe the menu here is like traditional, traditional French or is it a little bit more of like a, a new age version, if you will? So I would say it's still a traditional version of French cuisine, but it might not be what people think of as traditional French. Mm. A lot of times when people think of French cuisine, they're thinking of northern French cuisine. They're thinking of kind of heartier dishes, heavy dishes, stews, things like that. Whereas where we're coming from here is a little bit closer to Nice on the southern side of France, right along the Mediterranean. So it's still a very classic way of cooking there, but it focuses a lot more on lighter flavors, citrus, olives, fish, uh, and just very light cuisine. Yeah, because when I hear... Um, people say, you know, let the ingredients speak for themselves and just not doing too much to them. That is what I typically hear as like kind of the Italian style cooking. Uh, but in that whole region, there's so much agriculture and wonderful ingredients being produced from cheeses to, uh, vegetables and whatnot. It kind of is a beautiful way of cooking to just do what is minimally possible. And when I'm cooking at home, I like doing that as well because it's so much easier to make a delicious dish. But when you were doing like molecular gastronomy and uh, creating all sorts of incredible stuff, what are some highlights or some things that pop into your mind that people might not have tried before? As far as molecular gastronomy goes, uh, so at Alinea, we had probably our most famous dish was our balloon. It was a completely edible balloon filled with helium that was wow. brought to the table, floated out to the table uh, with an edible string. It was something you've never seen before, and I would highly recommend uh, you take a second and look that up because that's a very unique Will dish. Uh, one of the other things that we did that was one of my favorite dishes while I was there, we called it a strawberry tomato. 
So what we would do is we would take strawberries, juice them, and set them in a gelatin in a cherry tomato mold. Mm. And then we would take tomato juice and set that with gelatin in a strawberry mold. So you have this thing that looks exactly like a strawberry, but tastes like a tomato, and something that looks exactly like a tomato, but tastes like a strawberry. Wow. It's, it's really just kind of meant to kind of mess with people's minds and get uh-huh. them thinking in a different way about food. Well, and so we... Um We were in here recently to shoot some photos for our upcoming magazine that will be released in January, and you guys are in our roundup of French restaurants. And one of the things that you brought out was a tomato tart. That is something I've actually not seen before. I figure that's on your menu and not just a special item. Would you talk a little bit about that and maybe any other things that are kind of unique to a Scottsdale, Arizona food person? So our tomato tart, again, is actually one from... Uh, Laurent and mm. is a dish that he used to eat growing up as a kid and that he uh, specifically requested we have on our menu here. Wow. And it's just a very simple puff pastry shell filled with some charred tomatoes. We use on the vine tomatoes so they have that retain a little bit mm. extra sweetness. And then we just top it with stracciatella cheese, uh, which is kind of like similar to burrata. It's like the filling of burrata, that kind of creamy, okay. gooey cheese. Mm-hmm. And that's it. Simple as that. Um, it, it's just a very delicious uh, little bite-sized snack to get you started. Um, as far as our, some other dishes that are really fit, popular on our menu is our duck breast. Uh, we use Maple Leaf Farm ducks. Uh, it's a Muscovy duck. And then we uh, serve it with five different styles of beets. So again, letting the, the beet shine through. We have a beet puree of red beets. We have a confit yellow beet. We have candy striped beets that have been pickled, mm. and then we even take the beet greens off of them, and we saute the beet greens with a little bit of white wine and garlic, and top it off with some beet chips. Well, it's interesting. I don't typically gravitate towards duck, and whenever I talk with people about it, a lot of people's complaints are that it can be a little bit greasy, right? Um, but when you serve it with the beets like that, I would imagine that kind of juxtaposes kind of some of the, I don't necessarily want to say heaviness, but kind of the, the full flavor of duck, would you say so? Yeah, so duck has a little bit of gaminess to it uh, as a poultry, which goes really well with the earthiness of the beets. Mm. And then we have the pickle beets in there with the acidity that kind of cuts through, because obviously the duck has the large fat scat, uh, fat on the skin side. So we render that out as much as we can. So you're not getting a super chewy, fatty duck. You're going to get a nice kind of crispy, rendered duck skin. And then the acidity from the pickle beets kind of helps to really cut through that with the white wine as well, with the sauteed beet greens. We're using kind of some different flavor profiles to to cut through that typical fattiness of duck. Sure. So we kind of glossed over it a little bit, but how did you get into cooking in the first place? So it's kind of been in my family for a while. Uh, My grandparents owned a restaurant in New York. My uncle owned a food truck in New York City. So it's been ingrained in me. My mom is an amazing cook as well, although she focuses more on the the baking side of things. Mm. Uh, She actually was almost a baker and then decided to go a slightly different route in college. Uh, so it's just kind of been in my family. I grew up, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I would pull up a chair and stand next to the stove and kind of see what my mom was cooking and see what she was doing and, and just kind of just watch and absorb. So like the tomato tart is kind of rooted in the history of this place. Are there any items that you grew up eating that you look back on that kind of made you love cooking even more, or love food even more? So this one's going to be a little bit of an odd one. Uh, it was a classic that my mom used to make. Okay. Anytime we would make spaghetti for dinner, the following day, if we had leftover spaghetti, she would make something called fried spaghetti. Mm. And it was the leftover spaghetti tossed with a little bit of egg and cheese, some fresh herbs, and then just put in a saute pan so the bottom gets kind of crispy. Okay. And we would cut it and slice it up like a pizza. And that wow. was very simple and a way to use leftovers that was great uh that's something that stuck with me unfortunately it doesn't quite fit our cuisine here otherwise it would be on our menu (laughs) if i ever open up my own restaurant it'll be on that menu and i will want to be (laughs) first in line to try it because it sounds fantastic so when you do that are you kind of just spreading it out thin in a pan because if you're cutting it like a pizza i would imagine you have to exactly yeah you spread it out thin in the pan the eggs and the cheese kind of cook off and kind of help to bind it together so it holds together and then the bottom where it's on the pan starts to get a little bit crispy, so you get a little crunch and texture to it. Oh, that sounds so good. It sounds so good. <laughs> so bringing it back to here, we talked about the tomato tart. Is there anything else that you can think of on the menu currently that is kind of a representation of a little bit of that generational cuisine, if you will, something that was eaten as a child growing up? Uh, so, yeah, we have um, a niçoise salad. It's kind of a classic salad. It's the uh, seared ahi tuna, hairy couvert, which are French green beans, some mm. potatoes, a soft-boiled egg. It's a very traditional uh, 
French style that people are probably pretty familiar with. Uh, moving on top of that, on our lunch menu, we have a, it's called a pan bagné, which is a niçois salad on a bun, and that is definitely something that Laurent grew up eating, basically. It's a confit tuna instead of the seared ahi tuna. Uh, so that's definitely a classic. What is the difference between confit versus seared? So seared is just going to be on a uh, flat surface, kind of a little bit of oil, and then you just high temperature, and you're just searing the sides of it and the outside of it. Whereas confit, you're actually submerging it in a fat, usually an oil, and then you're cooking it at a low temperature. So confit just means cooked in fat, right? At a low temperature. At a low temperature, Except okay. it's different than frying, which is at the high temperature and kind of... Uh, so this, the lower temperature allows it to cook for longer and kind of break down a little bit more instead mm. of getting crispy like a high temperature fry. Okay. And are there any other items that pop into your head? Um, You've named quite a few of them, <laughs> oh, so if I you have, can't yeah. name any more, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to take a look at our menu again. We have quite an extensive menu, so I'm trying to remember everything at the same time. As no well. problem. <laughs> well, so to speak to that a little bit, you have uh, like a lunch menu, you have a dinner, and then brunch as well, correct? Yes. Would you talk a little bit about kind of the difference between your menus, maybe some of the items that don't necessarily carry over between the mm-hmm. three menus? So we try to have a good core group of items that are on all of the menus that okay. way people the, the familiar items people can get at any time however at lunch you know we do cater towards a little bit more of a fast-paced service so we do have some more salads and sandwiches that are easier for people to eat on their lunch breaks around the mall um, and to kind of facilitate that versus dinner where we have a little bit more refined plate ups such as the duck which is only on dinner um, and then brunch we just have a few extra egg options in there it's it's very similar to our lunch menu with the salads and sandwiches and then a few extra egg options like what would be some of the popular brunch items that you guys have so one of our most popular is called a murette blanc it is a play off of a traditional french dish called murette which is usually beef that has been sauteed with eggs and um, just stewed in red wine Mm. So we do ours uh, vegetarian style, so it's we're using mushrooms instead, and we're using white wine and cream, and we basically make a stew out of the cream, the mushrooms, and the white wine, and then finish it with two poached eggs. Wow. Mm. What else? Is there anything else? Because, I mean, that sounds fantastic. i got to know all the things to get when I come <laughs> in. I'm a big brunch guy, I'll say. So we also have some just uh, traditional omelets, um, very classic omelet with just goat cheese, uh, and it's like a garlic and herb goat cheese, and some fresh chives on top. That's very classic standard. Uh, we have a scrambled egg sandwich, kind of classic for everybody. Sides of, uh, we use local bacon and local sausage from oh, really? the pork shop. It's a local okay. Arizona company. So we're using their bacon and sausage. Is that something you're able to do throughout your menu? Yeah, we, we focus heavily on single source and local ingredients. Um, yeah, for our beef, we actually can say that all of our beef comes from Copper State Reserve, which is oh, located really? up in Prescott, Arizona. Wow. And they are very small uh, reserve. We actually purchase all of their prime hangers or skirt steak. Really? Uh, for our steak frites. And we are the only person that has their prime skirt steak. So it's, it's pretty nice to say that we can do that and, and we're able to work with them. So all of our beef on our menu comes from them. What is it like finding a small purveyor? And I say that with all due respect and care for what the word small means because I understand after having this conversation with a few different people to find someone that can kind of fit your scale and your needs especially at a restaurant with this many seats can be tricky to do how what was it like finding someone and how does the product shine uh, it's a, it's honestly a relief to find someone that can do that mm. you know it's uh, you know going back to our style of cuisine we're trying to limit how many places we're bringing things in from if we can just bring it all in from one person that I mean, it's easier as an operator, so we don't have to order it from multiple different places. But it's also nice that we can say, you know, hey, this beef is is that good that we want to use everything that you have. You know, we're not going to get anything else. We just want to use yours. Well, and I imagine that it's not like the most unique piece of beef that you've ever had before. But what is it about their steak that you guys like having it on your menu for? Uh, It is very high quality. Uh, It's it's all pasture raised you know they're, okay they're they're local they're not using any hormones or anything in there uh and and again it's that local factor there's not a whole lot of beef coming out of arizona and so to have a actual reserve in arizona is kind of it's just nice to be able to say that it's coming from from two hours away uh, we know exactly where it's coming from and then it's the traceability of it as well it's we can go and we can tour their pro, uh, their facilities and we can see exactly what they're doing to their cows um, and it's yeah. 
Are there any other parts of your menu that have that kind of same through line of being locally sourced um, or, you know, like do all your vegetables or certain vegetables come from a specific local purveyor? So we do try to do that as much as we can. Um, we get a lot of our baby vegetables, some of our microgreens, and all of our salad greens from Steadfast Farms. Mm. It's another local one in Arizona, as well as all of our chicken products are coming from Tuwash Ranch. Okay, wow. Yeah. So it's, it's impressive that you guys are able to do that so, you know, so much throughout your menu because it definitely is not a small restaurant. And I would imagine, you know, something like chicken or the steak, those are not items that you're just selling a few here and there, are they? <laughs> no, we're selling 40, 50 a day. Wow, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So do people respond to that when they come in? I figured that it's something that you're making known to people, yeah? Absolutely. Uh, we actually have a little blurb on our menu about Copper State. Uh, and all of our servers are, are aware of where our products come from, and they really try to make that a focal point of, of their spiels to guests, uh, to inform the guests as well and let them know, like, you know, this is what they're getting. This is why, you know, they're, they're coming to us. They're coming to us because we have these products, and we can say we have these products, and we mm. can show that we have these products. Well, and it's not like you guys just talk the talk of saying, oh, we want fresh products that, you know, highlight the quality of the ingredients. You're, you know going to that length of doing it, but then putting the information in front of the customer so that they can truly take their experience to the next level doing that. Uh, what are some of your favorite menu items? So we've kind of touched on a few of them. The tomato tart is, is one of my favorite appetizers. If I ever come in here, I'm always ordering one. Uh, the duck is another one. Uh, that's kind of why I brought them up earlier because I really wanted yeah. to, to hone in on them. Uh, as far as classics go, I mean, our steak frites is, is fantastic. Like I said, it's, it's the prime skirt steak from Copper State, so you can't really go wrong with that. Our mussels as well, uh, mm. one of my favorite dishes. Very, very simple. It's just a white wine butter sauce with a little bit of shallot, fennel, garlic, and a little bit of chili flakes. Just enough to get a little bit of spice, but not be spicy. Is it like mussels frites? It is, yes. Okay. So serve with a little bit of fries and our house mayo. That is like one of my favorite dishes of all mm. time. I didn't grow up eating a lot of seafood like that. Um, but man, there's something about like steak frites or mussels frites that that to me is like probably the thing that when I come in here for dinner sometime is going to be what I go for. So thank you for giving me that recommendation. <laughs> Absolutely. And again, it's just they're very simple dishes. It's a steak and fries and it's mussels and fries, but it's the ingredients that we're using in them, the, where we get our mussels from, it's where we get our steak from that we want to shine. We want that to be known. So we're not going to dress our steak up with a bunch of different sauces and garnish. Sure. We just want people to taste the steak because we're that happy with it. Yeah, absolutely. So a little bit of a pivot here, but talk to me a little bit about your beverage program. Yeah, so we have a, a great cocktail program and a great wine program. Uh, we're still working on our beer program a little bit, but um, yeah, we're, we're definitely known for our wines, a lot of French wines, a little bit of California wines as well. I mean, obviously we have some from all over the world, but um, so Mark, our GM, is, is basically our sommelier as well. Okay. Uh, he, he would be the one, if you wanted to do an interview on wines, he could probably talk to you for three hours just okay, on the wines. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then as far as our, our, our cocktail program goes, we have some great bartenders with Frank, Gage, Sean, Jordan, and Trevin. Uh, they all kind of work together to come up with the cocktails. There, there's no necessarily, you know, one person. We don't have a beverage director that's coming up with mm. all the cocktails. You know, each one of them has their own cocktails on the menu. So it's it's really uh, an inclusive team of people that's that's working together on that bar program. Are there? Are you a cocktail or a wine or a beer guy by chance? I'm more of a beer guy. Okay. Uh, and then then cocktails and then wine probably last last. Choice. Are you like a big Arizona beer guy or do you like more national brands? Uh, I, I try to drink local um, wherever I'm living, whether I was living in Chicago or mm -hmm. L.A. or here. I, I always try to drink you know, something that I can't get anywhere else. Sure. Do you have a favorite Arizona beer? Um, Kilt Lifter is probably really? a good one. Okay. That is, that is a fantastic. Uh, Are you like a, a dark beer guy in general? I, I, I like all beers pretty much. There's, there's not a beer that I don't like. Have you been to Goldwater is just up the road. Have you been there before? I have not. I would highly recommend it. They have one of them. I'm not like a big dark beer guy necessarily. I mean, like you, I'll drink all beers, but I don't necessarily gravitate towards them. Uh, but they have a beer called Machine Gun Teddy that is one of my favorite. It's a brown ale. And the only reason I don't drink more of it is because, you know, as a lot of darker beers are, they can make you a little bit more full, which means I get to drink less <laughs> beer. So I got to kind of walk that line. But whenever I go in there, uh, that's I always order one. I highly recommend it for you. I'll have to check that out. Maybe we'll have to get a beer there sometime. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, we are right now at the time of this recording in the 
the midst of the holiday season, Christmas is very much upon us. Will there be big changes to the menu or anything else you guys have going on here as we kind of transition into a new season in the new year? Absolutely. Uh, coming up on the new year, we're kind of kind of keeping it set in stone with the amount of uh, business we have going into the holiday season with, with Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely going to be very busy this couple of weeks, but I would definitely say expect some changes in the new year. Uh, we have just seasonality wise we're coming up on the heart of winter even though it's arizona doesn't feel quite so much like winter Uh, we are coming up on the heart of winter vegetables so we're going to start seeing some some more heartier dishes i say heartier with a with a pause there because we are not going to be doing heavy dishes but heartier um and so definitely in in the new year we'll have some some new changes well, it's funny. You say it doesn't feel like winter because you came from a place where it's a very different thing around this time of year. But for me and my friends and family, I'm like, man, this is absolutely freezing all the time. And my heater's been out for a little bit, too. So my house is like 60 degrees during the day. And that uh, that's pretty cold for me. So I, I had to break out my, my light sweatshirt the other day. So. <laughs> OK, yeah, I could I could so. imagine you just walking around out there right now. No jacket or anything like that. As I come in with my super duper thick jacket, that's how I get by. Well, man, thank you so much for sitting down. I can't wait to come in after the holidays and have one of those heartier dishes because I am so cold I might need one. Is there anything else you want to leave us with? Uh, No, not at the moment, I don't think. Uh, Just thank you for coming in. Uh, Looking forward to seeing the article, and, and yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, man. Can't wait to drop off some magazines, and when I do, maybe I'll have to steal you away for a little bit. We can grab that beer. Absolutely. Awesome. Cheers, man. Thank Thank you. Thank you.